Welcome to Grace Online. Grace Covenant Church is a people with a heart for God and God's heart for people. Just worship with us today.
Your life in me. 
Father, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for who you are. You are worthy of our worship right now. You're worthy of our worship right now. You're worthy of our worship yesterday. You're worthy of our worship tomorrow. So whoever's worshiping us with us now, he is worthy in that place. He is worthy in this place, at your home right now, if you're laying in bed, if you're on the couch, if you're in your car, if you're at your cubicle, if you're walking down the street, He is worthy of our praises. And Father, we lift you up right now. We worship you. We, we intently look and focus on you right now. And we ask that you become bigger in our perspective of you and our faith of you, in our pursuit of you. Father, thank you for letting us worship you. Amen. And I'm sitting here singing this song. And in the words of the song, it's saying I can see something. We can see God or I can see him moving. I can see his spirit. I can see his power. I can see God himself. And as I'm singing it, I know for myself, it's not always easy to see God in everything that goes on in our lives, is it? Some of you right now are, are trying to sing the song or you're saying the words, but in your heart of hearts, in your mind, you're like, man, I wish that were true because I don't see God right now. I don't see God in these circumstances. I don't see God in this area or this place. And I believe I have a word for the person that thinks that or for the multiple people who think that. And I believe God is saying to you right now, you're looking for me in the wrong place because you're looking up for me. But I'm right next to you. You don't have to look far off for God because my son, my daughter, I am with you right now. I am right next to you. I am right behind you. I am going in front of you. I live inside of you. I cover the outside of you. That God is Emmanuel. God is with us right now. And I want you to be encouraged 
Speak to yourself. Speak to your soul. I speak to you right now. Encourage yourself in the Lord because he is with you. He has never left you and he will always be with you. Father, thank you for being the great I am, the beginning and the end. Thank you for being everywhere. We ask that you become everything to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, God is an awesome God. And anything that's awesome, anything that's amazing, it's not just worthy of our praise, but it's worthy of our remembrance. We watch highlight reels of the greatest sports plays ever made, and we watch it over and over again. And right now we want to continue in worship, and we want to look at one of the greatest moves, in fact, the greatest move that ever happened in the existence of humanity. And it's Jesus dying on the cross for us. And we do that by taking communion together. Jesus said this. He said he, he, the, night before, the night that he was betrayed, he broke some bread and gave it to his disciples. And he gave them some wine and he said this. As often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. He said, this is my body that I will break for you. And then he had the wine and said, this is the blood that I will shed for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So if you don't have your communion elements, you can run to your kitchen. You can run to wherever you're at. You can hit pause and come back. But we want to take communion together as we remember his amazing grace. As we remember the greatest miracle to ever happen. And that's Jesus dying for our sins. So take whatever you have as the bread. Take it now and do this in remembrance of him breaking his body on the cross for you. And take what you have, the wine or the juice that resembles his blood. And let's drink this together. But as we do it, make sure we're watching the replay of him shedding his blood on the cross for you and for me. So drink in remembrance of the bloody shed. Father, we remember right now. It's, it's so easy to forget bloodshed because we see it so often. It's so easy to forget you breaking your body in the cross because we see bodies broken every day now. We literally see it. And in the same way, we remember those people who have fallen, who have murdered and killed. God, we remember you. You were killed on that cross. You were wrongfully accused. And you were murdered on the cross. But your amazing grace, God, is that that was the substitute for humanity. That in the darkest moment of killing God, of killing man, killing you, Jesus, actually turned out to be the greatest miracle. And that is worthy of remembering. That is the greatest comeback story of all of humanity. We thank you, Lord, that you truly are amazing. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that we can take communion together and remember you. Help us do this as often as we break bread and drink juice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Family, it's good to, to be here together worshiping in faith with one another. So I want you to go ahead and look around if you're, if you're with anybody or if you're texting people or watching this live right now on Church Online platform. Go ahead and put a comment in there. Say hi. Say amen. Say hello. Because we really are walking through everything together. Distant, maybe, but together, absolutely. And so as we continue in our act of worship, we, we want to, to, to move over to our time of our tithe and our offering right now. And I want to read the scripture to you real quick. It comes from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. 
and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I love this. It's talking about giving your tithe or 10%. And if you want to do so, the instructions will be on the screen for you. If you want to mail a check, you can send it to our building at 3100 18th Street, Northeast D.C. But it's not just a transaction of money. It's really an action of faith. When we tithe our 10% and when we give our offering anything above that, it is a step of faith in trusting God. He says, test me in this. So he's testing us with what we do with our money. But we give God our money, but what he gives back is not just money. It says here, I will pour out the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. See, we give God our money, which is showing what? Our, our money says in God we trust. But so many times we put our trust in our own ability, our own strength. We put our trust in other systems or other people. But if we put our trust in God truly, and we say, God, we give you what you require and what you ask, and I do so in faith, in response, what he gives us back are blessings. And I love this. The more you test God with this, the greater your trust of him will be, not just with your money, which is something that comes and goes, but you'll be able to trust him with your very life, your very soul, and the very destiny that you have before you, which is far more valuable than any numerical value in your bank account. Test God this week by giving your tithe and offering, but watch him grow your trust as he pours out blessings from above. I hope that encourages you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that through giving our tithe and our offering, bringing it to you, Lord, that you give back so much more. And I pray that everyone who gives today, you would bless them. It's not just the size and the amount that they give, but it's the faith in which they do so. Meet them at their place of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Pastor Donnell. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Richard. What a great moment uh, to all be together uh, to worship. I pray your heart's encouraged. And we're going to continue uh, this moment to honor God and to, uh, to ask that he would fill us, changing our minds, changing our hearts, changing our cities, changing our nations. So what I'd like to do in this moment is to ask that we would all have a moment of silence to honor the life of George Floyd. And I'm going to ask if the worship team would, in this moment, also be silent with the instruments. And after we're silent for a moment, I'll pray and I'll ask if the worship team will begin at the time I start praying. So wherever you are, sitting at home, driving in your car, walking outside, if you could just pause for one moment, one moment of silence. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the life of George Floyd. His family calls him Perry. I thank you for his life. I thank you that his Life matters. I thank you that his life matters to you. And because 
His life matters to you. His life should matter to all people everywhere. For eight minutes and 46 seconds, the world watched. We were all watching together a picture of 400 years of injustice. But I'm convinced, I'm convinced that this is our time. This is the hour. And I thank you for a sound from heaven. I thank you for a vision from heaven. A vision from heaven for America. A vision from heaven for African American people, black people everywhere. I thank you that you're a God who heals. And I'm asking that you would heal the African American community. I'm asking that you would heal America because one can't happen without the other. Our trust, our trust this time is in you, not ourselves. In you, not our systems. In you, not our solutions. In you, in the word you speak and its ability to change the mind, to change the heart to change a man, to change any man, to change every man, any woman, every woman who gives place to you fully in their hearts and their lives. So we thank you. Amen. Amen. Let's just give God a shout. Just give him praise. There's a handful of us in this room, and we are missing you. We are missing you. So I am hugging you right now, virtually, emotionally, every which way except physically. So chat back at me. Chat back at the worship team. Let's exchange this great love that God has given us for one another. Amen? All right. Worship team, thank you so much. Give them a hand as they begin to take their seats. Racism is sin. Racism is sin. And sin is a disease of the heart. America has heart disease. She was born with it. She's had it all her life. She's not well. And what began in her heart has now spread throughout all her body. It's, it's everywhere. It's in her arms. It's in her legs. It's everywhere. It's in all her systems. It's in her educational system. It's in her criminal justice system. It's in her political system. It's in her, 
religious practices and the way she worships God. It is everywhere. And now, in this moment, her heart has been exposed to the entire world. The entire world is looking at her heart. The last time she had surgery was in the 60s, the civil rights movement. And that moment, that movement sustained her life a little bit longer. But this time, she will need more than surgery. She's going to have to change her diet. Surgery won't be enough. She's got to change her diet. She can't feed on what she has fed on all her life. Outwardly, she's appeared to be fine, but inwardly, not well. She's not well. And her heart, her chest is wide open. And she's on a table. And this moment is a moment unlike any other moment. It is a moment that I believe is literally our time. I'm convinced that this is our time. That this is the hour. That she not only allows the surgeon to carefully cut the racism, the prejudice, the bigotry out of her heart, but that when she is stitched back up, that she will change her diet and she will not continue to feed on the things that are the source of her illness. And I believe the chief physician, the great physician, is standing standing at her bedside and he can help he can help in acts chapter 10 verses 9 through 16 luke a physician himself tells of a moment that has some application to the moment in which we find ourselves presently. I'm going to read to you verses 9 through 16. Listen carefully. About noon, the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Quote, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. End quote. This happened three times. This happened three times. This happened three times. And immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Holy Spirit, help us, please. You are our helper, so we look to you, not ourselves in this moment. Hmm. (laughs) 
Erna Parks. She's an author of a book entitled Long Shadows, Truth, Lies, and History. It's an examination of how nations deal with their past and how some deal with their past really well and how others don't do well at all. I'm praying that as we progress into our future, we deal with our past a lot better than we have up to this moment. Here's what she says. Perhaps learning happens when we are startled out of our prejudices that we are barely aware of. Do you want to hear that again? I do. Perhaps learning happens. Perhaps learning happens when we are startled out of our prejudices that we are barely aware of. So many are saying today, how has this happened? Uh, Why is this still going on in light of everything that's happened all of our history up to this moment? How is it still possible in the United States of America in 2020 that there is still blatant racism and injustices inflicted upon black people everywhere in our society? How is it possible that our systems continue to fail us again and again and again? Will it ever stop? How is it still possible? But this moment is unlike any other moment. This moment has jolted the very heart of America. It has exposed our heart. Our chest is wide open. She's laying on a table, seemingly helpless. And if she recovers, she can't live the way she lived before. She can't die it the way she died it before. It will not work going forward. Hmm. All her systems. I'm so glad to see the marches that are occurring all over the nation. The marches happening on yesterday, Saturday, here in Washington, D.C., So many people showing up. The marches that will take place tomorrow on Sunday. Churches gathering and marching. This very day. I'm so grateful that when I see those marching, that it is a a litany of people from every spectrum of life. To see whites, to see blacks, to see Latinos, to see Asians, to see all these people showing up and saying no more. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to God. I have my moments, but there's a joy that is not find its source in what is happening outside. There's a river that makes glad the city of God. There's a river that flows in our hearts that gives us great joy. And if you want a different analogy, there's a fire that burns in us. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit. And it burns in such a way that the fires burning outside don't consume us because the fire on the inside is greater than the fire on the outside. Let that fire burn in you. It's a fire that builds, not a fire that tears down. The criminal justice system. We could talk about all the systems, and we've got time. We've got time today. We've got time tomorrow. We've got time next week. I thank God for moving our nation from hurting to healing. I believe that's what's happening. I've been in so many conversations with so many people. I've been in conversations with my family, like you. I've been in conversations with our church. We've been showing up online and speaking freely and frankly from our hearts and minds. And we're going to continue to do it. 
We'll be together online tonight, 7 o'clock. Look for the details in the chat. This is an unending conversation. I had a conversation with friends of mine who are pastors. Six of us had a moment this past week. Two of us African American. The other four white. We lamented together. We wept together. There was repentance. And I felt something in my heart that I thought, God, this is right. America's heart is not right. America's heart is not just. Something's wrong. But that moment with my friends is the beginning of something that expands where we've already come to date in our friendship. And I'm thankful for what God's done in our relationships up to this point, that a moment like this in our nation, so provocative, could allow us to go further. Mm. I want to be excited about our future. I had another conversation with a young man who's in athletics. Uh, He's a coach. We were talking, and we had a call with a bunch of athletes and coaches, and he called me right after. He said, while you were talking to us, while you were talking, I started texting every one of my black friends that I knew, reaching out to them. He'd already spoken to some he was close with, but he started reaching out to others. And he said, thank you for that. I'm just reaching out to them. And the conversation moved beyond that. And and he said, you know, my dad was a cop growing up. And I remember as a boy, I just wanted my dad to come home at night. That's all I wanted as a boy. And in that moment on the phone, I said to him, I think that's all that George Floyd's mama would have wanted was for him to come home when he was a boy. You wanted your dad, a cop, to come home. His mama wanted him to come home. It gave him a new perspective. He said, I never saw it that way. That's what Erna Parks is talking about. Perhaps learning happens when we are startled out of our prejudices that we are barely aware of. Our nation has been startled. His mama, George's mama would have wanted him to come home. His daughter would have wanted him to come home. His family would have wanted him to come home. We all would have wanted him to come home. Lord, show us where you're at work. You know, changing the system is so important. We've got to take action. What does it look like to change the criminal justice system? What does it look like to change the political system? What does it look like to change the educational system? What does it look like to change the arm, the leg, uh, the the legs, the arms, feet of America? Uh, My concern is that if we change systems only, the disease remains in the heart. And so what's in the heart will grow back through the systems all over again. I think history has shown us that enough. Oddly enough, I was a student at American University. I was sitting in a, a classroom, the only African American, all whites, a white adjunct professor. I so appreciated him. It was a criminal justice course. And this was in the early 90s. There was a book he required us to read. It's called Pipe Dream Blues. Pipe Dream Blues, Clarence Lesane. The author had written a book about the war on drugs being a complete farce, how the African American was made out as this narco-terrorist and was at the top of some chain in terms of the pecking order of who's most threatening when it comes to uh, our livelihood and our safety. And he said it's quite the opposite. The African American uh, that's painted as this narco-terrorist is not at the top, he's really at the bottom. 
He's, he's unemployed oftentimes. He's without life insurance. He's without health insurance. And the conditions of society somehow have predispositioned him to end up someplace that he ought not be. But it's those who are in a higher pecking order that really have greater responsibility. That stayed with me sitting in the class as this white adjunct professor is sitting there with all of our white students, and I'm the only African American. He, he's looking me in my eyes as we have this conversation. And I'm startled because we get to the chapter where I'm astounded. I'm an African American man. I've grown up in Washington, D.C., I've lived in the D.C. area my entire life, but it took me coming to this course to have my eyes open. At that point, the statistics nationally were that the commission of crime between black youth and white youth, somewhere between the ages of 14 up to 18, maybe 20, that the commission of crime between black youth and white youth, virtually the same, very little disparity. My mind was shifting in that moment. What? Virtually the same, he had pulled data, national statistics. So what you're saying to me is that if I take a 16-year-old white young man and a 16-year-old black young man, that their criminal activity nationwide is virtually the same. Think about that. He says the disparity is not in the commission of crime. It's in the selection process of, of arrest and incarceration. At that point in his book, and Clarence, he brought Clarence to the class. I, I had no idea he knew the author. He walks into our class and he begins to speak to us. And my heart was just sitting there listening to him. This is amazing. As I begin to understand that, Two out of every four African-American men will pass through the criminal justice system. In sociology, we use words like phenotypical, which just basically says from white moving to black, the top of the system, you find more whites, and as you go down to prison population, you find more African-Americans. Of course, that's all changing, but this is the moment where, or we hope, we believe, we dare to ask God. But that's where the real disparity is. The criminal justice system. How do you change it? I think we can learn something from the text that helps us. There's a man named Cornelius. I like the name Cornelius. Cornelius, what's up? How you doing, man? I feel you. Cornelius is a God-fearing man. He prays to God. He gives to the poor. He's not a Jew. He's not a Jewish man. He's living in a time where it is actually unlawful for a man like Cornelius, a Gentile, which is another name for being anyone other than a Jew, some other nation, some other ethnicity. You got this moment where God shows up at Cornelius' home. He sends an angel to him. Cornelius, your prayers and your gifts to God have actually come to his attention. It's come up like a sweet-smelling aroma. God loves the aroma of your prayers and the aroma of your gifts to the poor. He's so pleased with it. It's amazing. God's pleased with this non-Jew. And he tells Cornelius, I want you to send for a man named Simon called Peter. 
He's in a place called Joppa, staying with Sam, Simon the Tanner. That beats text message, and I tell you what, if God just tell you a guy's address. And immediately, he sends one of his devoted soldiers and a servant with him, and they start heading to Joppa to go find Simon Peter, who is a Jew, who is a believer, who is a disciple, who is a follower of Jesus, who is a lover of God, who is a leader. And something happens. You've got you to gotta go back and know because we won't unpack it right now, maybe in the days to come. But the hostility between Jews and Gentiles is serious at this point. It is serious. They do not associate with one another. The, the, it is bad. But they come to the home. And they have a moment. And it's a moment that I want to focus on. But there's something more significant that we can't pass over before we get to that moment. These men arrive at the gate. They don't enter the gate because they know that Jews and Gentiles do not associate. They just stop at the gate. We're going to unpack that later. But let's go back to what's happening while they're traveling. Peter goes up on the rooftop, the balcony of Simon the Tanner's home. Lunch is being prepared. A meal is being prepared. He became hungry. He has an appetite. And as a Jew who is a Church leader, great fisherman. He's probably really excited. Maybe some fish is being broiled. I don't know. But he became hungry. You know what it's like when you're hungry and you're ready to eat. There's so many places we enjoy having food. So many places, so many things. You like. Chat right now. What's your favorite food? I'm, you're probably getting hungry just by me talking about food. What's your favorite food? If you could eat right, some of you are eating right now sitting there watching this virtually, not mad at you. Whatever his food was, it was being prepared. But he goes up on the rooftop and he falls into this trance, this state between uh, uh, being awake, being asleep, but God has his attention. It's amazing how God can get your attention when you're in that place of rest. And something happens. It says a sheep. I want to get it right. I want you to hear it. Verse 11. He saw. He saw. He saw. Nothing can happen until we see. He saw. Heaven opened. And something, something like a large sheep. It wasn't actually a large sheep, but that's the best he can describe it. He saw a large sheep, sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. And it contained all kinds of four-footed animals, reptiles, birds. It's got snakes. It's got birds. There's probably some chicken on it. There's probably other four-footed animals. There's probably some beef on that thing. Nothing kosher. So he's probably troubled in his dream. Here's a moment where he saw something, and God is trying to bend his mind, change his mind, break him out of his way of thinking. It's what Erna Park said earlier. Perhaps learning happens when we are startled out of our prejudices that we are barely aware of. He, he's, he's startled by the dream. He's puzzled by it. It's affecting his mind, his way of thinking. It's going to affect his heart as well. And he's probably shocked when God says, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. He says, no, Lord. 
the resistance to God. Because God says, here's what I got an appetite for. And this is the only thing you have an appetite for. And I'm trying to get you to have an appetite for what I have an appetite for. So when you say no, I've never eaten anything unclean, and you know that that is the food that's eaten by people who you don't associate with, who you have issues with, who you have list, 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 then you realize there's something in my heart that's not in your heart, and there's something in your heart that's not in mine. This happened three times. And immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. I don't know why it happened three times. I know three is significant. When something is mentioned in the Bible three times, we understand that it's repeated for purposes of emphasis. It's repeated because of its significance. Jesus actually prays in the Garden of Gethsemane a prayer three times. We see this all through Scripture. Why did this happen three times? I don't know. But I know an impression that I have on my heart, and I think about our history, and history, when you look at it, it's, It's not always very clear, but I'm encouraged. This happened three times. You need to know that prior to this moment, Peter had prayed for a young man named Aeneas who was a man with disabilities. He was paralyzed. He hadn't walked for eight years. And the Spirit of God on Peter moved him, and he prayed for that man, and a person with disability walked. Shortly after that, Simon Peter is then asked to go visit a woman named Dorcas, and Dorcas is a woman who died, and these women are weeping over the loss of her life, and in the moment they ask Peter to come, Peter asks everyone to leave the room. He kneels and he prays to God, and the Spirit of God working in his life causes him to turn to Dorcas and say, get up, and this dead woman comes back to life. And the same Spirit of God that's in this man working with Aeneas, the same Spirit of God that's in him working to raise a dead woman is now the same Spirit of God working in him, working in him, working in him to bring him to the grips of the prejudices that are in his heart that he is barely aware of. And he's almost reluctant to go. Maybe that's why it had to happen three times. I Pete, this is important. Pete, this is important. This is what I have an appetite for. This is what I love. Do you see it? You need to change. You need to repent. You need to see it the way I see it. And again, I don't know what the three things are, but I want to suggest something. It happened three times. If I look at American history and I think, Lord, is there something akin to three times that you have lowered a sheet in America? As her heart is exposed, laying open right now, is there anything where there's a sheet and I'm just going to offer this, do with it what you will. But I want to say that the first time that God lowered a sheet in America was emancipation. That was the moment that we as slaves got to go free, that he broke the shackles that had us bodies prisoned. That was the first time the sheet was lowered, and it did great things. I'm grateful for what the Emancipation Proclamation did, and we could unpack that about what it did, what it didn't do, what Slaves did at that moment what they didn't do. But I just want to say that's the first time the sheep got lower. And it came at a great battle, a great fight, the Civil War. I want to suggest that there's a second time the sheep got lower. The second time the sheep got lowered was in the 60s with legislation 
That was the immense, that was the civil rights movement. The sword that heals. Nonviolent direct action. So if that's the first time, emancipation, and if the second time is legislation, then what's the third time? The third time? This is our time. This is the hour. You don't have any other moment in history quite like this one. There was emancipation. There was legislation. But this moment, the third time, this is our moment. This is the hour. And there will not be another one quite like it. This is the moment where black men, black women, white men, white women have got to come together. I love seeing you out there, all my millennials, all the ethnic peoples coming together and saying enough's enough because we had emancipation. We've had legislation. But if you change the system and don't change the heart, the disease remains. So there's got to be a sword sharp enough to cut the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, 12 says this, that the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates further than legislation. You can't just change behavior. You actually need God to come down as a Savior who changes the heart. You see, the sword of the Spirit pierces dividing joint, uh, bone, marrow. It actually separates soul and spirit, and it can judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. When you get to the thought in a man, when you get to the intention in a man, you can have legislation. But if the man's heart has been changed, the legislation doesn't restrain him because his own heart does. We've had legislation, but it didn't stop us. John Quincy Adams says that the Constitution was written, and I know it didn't, it wasn't written with me in mind. It was written to govern a moral and religious people. Well, at the time he said it, slavery was going on. So how moral and religious were we? God wants to go to the motivation. Because when he goes to the motivation, like Peter, he starts changing your mind. He starts changing your heart. And then he can change your ways. We need a change in behavior. But if you change the heart, the hands will follow the heart. The hands aren't good or evil. It's the heart. If racism is, is in the heart, it will come out of the mouth, it will come out of the hands. It will come out in the knees. But if the Word of God penetrates and convicts a man in his heart, convicts him, to the point of change in his mind, repentance. Repentance, godly sorrow, not just a confession, I'm sorry, but brokenness, contrition. Then there's hope for America to live. There's hope for America to live. I want to pray for you. You see, when Peter saw something. He saw a vision. But that vision came from heaven. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What should we do? There's a lot we can do, but let's make sure it's a vision from heaven. There's a vision from heaven. You see, there's the vision and a dream that comes from heaven. Well, what are we going to do? Then he says, get up, kill, and eat. That's the, 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 the mission is now the team. It's the team and the action. It's, it's what we do. And so I'm believing that God is going to give us a clear vision, a dream. And I believe in terms of the action, whatever he tells us to do, we will do it. But it's got to change in the heart. So let me start with the first vision that he's given us. That he is king, that he is Lord. And you may be watching right now. And you have not bowed your knee to 
accepted Jesus as Lord, whoever you are watching, I think this is a moment. This is our moment. This is your moment. This is the hour. And you want to be a part of what God's doing. You want to be on his side. You don't want to find yourself against him. So this is a moment for you to yield and to surrender your life to him so that he can give you an appetite for what he has an appetite for. So I want to pray this with you, whoever you are, wherever you are. Say these words if you want to surrender your life to Jesus. Jesus, I am a sinner. I have not lived a life that pleases you. Without faith, it's impossible to please you. I thank you for giving me faith today to believe you, to recognize that when you were on that cross, you were not dying for yourself. You were dying for me, even if it was in my ignorance. But today, you have awakened me. And I see my desperate need for you to change not just my arms, not just my legs, not just my feet, but to change my heart, to cut me at the level that real change starts so that I can follow you, believe you, be your own. I give you my life. Help me. You are my Lord. chat, you can just put, raise your hand, let us know that you're committing your life to Jesus and somebody will connect with you if you so desire. There's another group of people you're already following, you're already believing, you're already, but God's just, he, it's not just a change in your behavior, it's a change in your thinking, it's repentance, it's a change in your heart. Pray this, Lord Jesus, ah, oh, thank you for your knife that can cut away sin in my heart and heal me afterwards. I repent of my ignorance, my arrogance, my sin, my prejudice, my bigotry, everything in me that's not in you. Take it out of me. I thank you that I can continue further in this journey with you. We started before today, but I want to I wanna, I wanna have an appetite for what you have an appetite. I want to feed on what you feed on. Help me. Save me. Renew me. Make me new. Amen. Love you so much. Um, appreciate this moment together. Remember to join us tonight at 7. And um, we're going to continue by the grace of God to become who he's called us to be. We're just scratching the surface. So, uh, we're just scratching the surface. I love you. Much grace.